and we're live. Well, welcome to the School of Public Health, University of Maryland's new show entitled The Cutting Edge. And of course, uh, I'm Omar Neal, I'm the, uh, one of your hosts. And of course, we are so uh, happy to have you. I'm the former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, as well as the host of the You Got the Power show. And of course, uh, you can follow us on Facebook and uh, YouTube and Twitter, as well as uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's the other one, Doc? It's the, uh, uh, we, we have, we have uh, them all. You can, you can uh, follow us there as well, YouTube and uh, all. Now, let me tell you, we have a wonderful uh, lineup today. We're going to be talking uh, with uh, uh, the president of uh, NBCSL. Uh, that's uh, the National Black uh, Caucus uh, of State Legislators. And of course, uh, Representative Billy Mitchell uh, will be joining us a little bit later on. Uh, the newly elected uh, president-elect, uh, Laura Hall, uh, Representative Laura Hall of uh, of Alabama. And of course, we have our delegate who has been with us many, many times, uh, Delegate uh, Jocelyn Pina Melnick, uh, who will be with us today. Uh, we have the executive director of NBCSL, uh, Paula Hossington. And of course, we will have uh, joining with us a little later on, uh, Senator uh, Bobby Singleton of Alabama, as well as none, uh, certainly uh, last but certainly not least, Representative Anthony Daniels of uh, Alabama as well, a representative of Alabama. We, we are going to have a wonderful uh, discussion today about uh, politics and uh, the pandemic, how public policy can influence public health outcomes. Uh, I am uh, elated to, uh, to now uh, bring forth uh, my sidekick. Uh, <laughs> we, we call him uh, Dr. T. Uh, but it's the Dr. Stephen Thomas, and of course, uh, I started to name the show Dr. T and Me, but, uh, <laughs> but we decided that uh, the cutting edge would be a, a good enough. Uh, let's uh, uh, welcome Dr. T. How you doing, man? It's always good to be with you, Mr. Mayor, and what a week we've had, and what a show we have coming up, and the one we had last week, and I'm happy to acknowledge the folks behind the scenes, they popped up there a little bit with uh, making all this happen. I'm also flying the flag of the state of Maryland because we mm. have one of our special elected officials on tonight with us. And I'm giving a shout out to Shirley Nathan Pulliam, who really is the architect of the health equity enterprise here in the state of Maryland. She's a little under the weather out there. Shirley will pull them for you. And uh, Omar, I'm telling you that the phone's been ringing off the hook. The demand has shifted as our communities are now asking for, where can I get vaccinated? Where can I get my mask? Where can I get those rapid tests? And we need to make sure that our network that we built here makes that possible for them. And that we lift up their voices as we're talking to our elected officials who can help move the policy levers to make some of this sustainable. The innovations that have come out of this pandemic can be sustainable. Yeah, you know one of the things that uh, we want to do. If you are, if you could bring up uh, uh, our delegate, uh, uh, delegate Jocelyn Pina Melnick uh, up uh, on the screen to hang out with us. I want you to introduce uh, our distinguished uh, <laughs> friend, uh, Dr. T. Well, you know, I've been in the state of Maryland now for eleven years. And one of the first elected officials I met was Johnson Pena Melnick. And she's been a champion for many of the innovations that have happened here in the state of Maryland. And as you can see her in her bio, uh, a child, she was an immigrant from the Dominican Republic. And we are in Dominican barbershops and beauty salons and uh, moved uh, from New York, garment industry, uh, a person who is a voice of the under underclass, the, the folks who have had no voice. And here in the state of Maryland has been able to really move powerful legislation 
including but not limited to the fact that medical physicians in the state of Maryland, in order to have their license renewed, must complete implicit bias training and other uh, structural changes that make what she's done just monumental. Come and give some snaps to Absolutely. Delegate Jocelyn yes, yes. Pena-Melnick. Welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you so much. It is such a blessing to be with all of you here today. I am fire up and ready to go. <laughs> good, good. That's fabulous. You, you know, one of the things uh, we wanted to talk about, because, you know, you don't normally, um, you know, relate politics to public health as much as we are today. Uh, that there is a direct nexus correlation between public policy and public health. And what we're finding is that oftentimes the public policy can influence public health. It literally can be the difference between life and death. Are you seeing it that way, uh, Delegate? Absolutely. You know, as a public servant, and I prefer that word rather than politician, um, <laughs> because I do this seven days a week. It is not a part time job. It's not just legislating when we're in session, which we are right now, 90 days a week, 90 days um, during the year, um, every day. Um, it's also when we're not in session doing a lot of, uh, you know, social work, right, helping someone find food, apply for Medicaid, apply for food stamps, um, someone who, who's in a hospital. I mean, we do all of that. Um, so being, coming with certain experiences, you know, gets you in the room and having a certain background and caring about certain issues allow us to have a voice. So for someone like myself, who's you know, uh, a Latina, a Black Latina, right? Um, an Afro-Latina who brings that experience of growing up in a house with 17 people, sometimes not having a meal, okay? Walking to school for more than an hour, growing up with a single mom who was given 15 minutes at work um, to have her meal, you know, where she said, you're, I'm not gonna leave anything to you when I die, but you're gonna get an education learning that an education is a great equalizer. When I'm in a room, I bring that background. I can relate to you know, the fact that we have all these social determinants of health, that the way we live affects our health, right? Because I lived in an apartment building mm -hmm. on the fifth floor. I can relate to the fact that we had to apply for Medicaid because we didn't have health care. I can relate to the fact that my mom made less than minimum wage. I can relate to the fact that we had to walk and had no transportation. So when I, as a policymaker, come to the table with those experience, experiences, I also bring that experience so that my experiences and others can shape that policy. And that policy can you know, achieve health equity, right? Focus on efforts to address injustices, overcome obstacles to health and healthcare, and God willing, eliminate preventable health disparities. So your experience as a policymaker matters because you speak up and you can change that bill the way it's drafted. And if you don't see the voice, the voices that that bill will affect or not affect, you can bring them to the table. So it's mm -hmm. very important. It's very, very important to have a voice and to have diversity and inclusion. Good. You know, at the, at the top, I, I mentioned Shirley Nathan Pulliam and the, and the path she opened up. How important is it mentoring in doing the kind of policy that you're advocating, that you're describing? Very important when I first started 15 years ago, and I love Shirley, that's my mom. You know, I, I feel that there's a, a Buddhist saying that I like to, to use it that says that you don't die when you're cremated or when you're buried. You die when the last deed you have performed on earth is forgotten. So surely is going to live for you know decades, centuries to come because of all the work that we're doing. A lot of the work that I have done, like putting in the bill to address implicit bias or declaring racism in yes. Maryland, which yes. I did last year as a, uh, as a public health crisis, right? 
Yes. Those bills came from Shirley. And she took me on. She did not feel threatened. She saw this young, wild person. <laughs> and, you know, she needed to simmer down and to, you know, just read me the right act and tell me how things are done. And, and then before she left to the Senate, she advocated for me to get her, her subcommittee because I didn't have a subcommittee. And she got behind me. So women, we must help each other as well, right? Mm -hmm, Lift mm -hmm. ourselves up. And she surely did that to me. She lifted me up. She extended a hand. And I don't forget that because I feel that just like I reflect my mom who's no longer alive, mm -hmm. I reflect Shirley in my work mm -hmm. because it's hard work. Thank you. You know, this is, uh, this is in incredible. Let's just bring up uh, a Representative Anthony Daniels. I want to, uh, uh, to talk with him uh, now. Uh, Representative Daniels is uh, uh, a representative of uh, District uh, 53 for the state of Alabama. Uh, you know, you can read his bio, but let me tell you something about this, this brother. Um, <laughs> he is as comfortable in the streets as he is in the streets, right? And he is a person who is conscientious. Uh, he is um, uh, a person who speaks the same language when it's not appropriate or when it's when it when when danger can lurk for you to mm. talk. But you speak up because you know it's right to speak up. Mm -hmm. If you want a representative, you want somebody who will represent you with courage. Well, that's what I see. Uh, in Representative Daniels, a courageous leader, not a politician, as you say, uh, delegate, uh, but a public servant. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming my friend. <laughs> All right. Anthony Daniels. Hey, man, how you doing? An honor. Doing, welcome. Doing welcome. good, Mayor. How are you? Thank you for having good. me. Good. You know, I mean, you're down in Alabama, man, and, uh, you know, you are dealing with uh, uh, a situation where you're in a minority. Uh, in both how, uh, the representative as well as the Senate. And it's a super minority, which means that uh, the Republican Party has a uh, super majority in both of the houses. I want to I want to I want to know from that perspective and with the highly polarized uh, issue as this pandemic. How, how do you navigate that? There, there is a thing that says that politics should stop at the water's edge, meaning that if it's something that's foreign, that, that we can handle our domestic issues, but whether things are foreign, we, we, we all come together as one. Can, 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 is, is it possible to have that same approach when it comes to public health, where people are dying, regardless of their political affiliation, in a space that's so highly polarized. So uh, to answer your question, it's very difficult. Uh, as you know, Alabama being from, you know, in Alabama, it's very difficult and, and always a challenge to, to navigate. But at the end of the day, as, as leaders, um, whether you're in Maryland or Alabama, um, the, the goal is you have to play chess. Uh, many of us play checkers, but you have to play chess. And in this environment, you have to play 3D chess. And so you have to be way, way ahead of the, the other side, but you have to, to find areas of common ground and focus on those areas of common ground. You know, everyone wants uh, a healthy community. Uh, all of the needs in many of the communities and many of the zip codes and areas across the state of Alabama have similar needs. And then educating poor whites and, and for African-Americans to understand that they are facing the same issues regardless of their, the color of their skin. And so pointing out the obvious, uh, things like uh, 17 hospital closures in the last 10 years in the state of Alabama, uh, more than 300 and some thousand Alabamians denied access to uh, because we didn't expand Medicaid. 17,000 deaths in the state of Alabama as a result of COVID-19. Those issues are, are not partisan issues. Those are issues that where all of us should be should come together. And so what we've been able to do in Alabama is just last week we negotiated the uh, CARES Act, the ARPA funding, and what prior where the priorities should be. 
uh, my colleagues had on that particular uh, proposal had state parks and historic sites, which includes Confederate monuments as one of the areas of focus. And so uh, Senator Singleton and I are in the leadership team uh, pushed back on that. And so they were able to, and the governor said, look, I'm, we're not gonna push a bill in a special session unless both parties are in agreement. And so having someone like Governor Ivory, despite some of the things that we disagree on, uh, she was able to push lead in that direction and being at the table and not on the table also makes a difference. We meet with Governor Ivory uh, every month as a leadership team, not just Republicans meeting, but Democrat uh, minority leaders meeting with the governor and the other leadership. And so we're able to bake the cake uh, long before it hits the floor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Rep Representative, you, you, know, you, you, you shared some facts that were very compelling to me. My question is in the environment that we're in now, when you have facts coming up against fiction, how do you legislate, how do you do policy when there's no consensus on what is truth and what is a fact? Well, one of the things that we, we have to, to our advantage right now is I've focused the last three and a half years on creating our own echo chamber, uh, meaning that uh, we're communicating with our base and communicating with more educated base on the other side and bringing forth uh, playing more offense, but playing better defense than we've played in the past. Typically, you, as a Democrat, you've been fortunate enough to be in a position to always govern, even in a state like Alabama. Before 2010, we were in a supermajority as Democrats in Alabama before 2010. And so uh, Republicans had 100 years to play defense. And so I've always, I've been playing defense my entire life. So this is nothing new to me. Uh, and so coming in in the legislature in 2014, as a representative and the minority leader in 2017, uh, we just focused on uh, playing better defense uh, and pushing back on extreme policies, educating the public. Because at the end of the day, uh, to be honest, uh, we have this inside joke where, you know, the other side take the agenda that we put forth, but they take it a year afterwards because they have little, they don't have a lot of ideas. Mm. They don't bring a lot to the table of pushing things that are forward thinking and progressive in nature, but that's good for Alabama. And so what we're beginning to see is that uh, we're fine with the delay in, in our agenda being implemented as long as the outcomes are the same. And okay. we're beginning to see even Republicans have discussions about Medicaid expansion, uh, which is very new and, and very mm. unique. Uh, but you know, everyone all across the state of Alabama, they're feeling the same thing. And so it's, it's, it's quite interesting, uh, but you just always got to think way ahead of, of the other side and, and, and figure out ways to get it done. Thank you. You know, um, thank you so much, uh, Representative Daniels. Uh, let's, let's bring up uh, the executive director of uh, NBCSL, uh, Paula Hosington. Uh, let me let me tell you a little bit about her, what I observed. You can read uh, whatever, <laughs> but uh, the point of the matter is, let me tell you something. When, when I uh, first met her, uh, it was uh, at a conference recently uh, that they had their annual conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And I observed her, uh, demeanor and the way that she um, conducted herself. And, and you know, you've heard of the CR code where you can click on it and it'll take you to a destination. Well, well I, I saw her as a CR code, like, like, like a calm rock. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, she was calm, you know, but she was solid as a rock. I can see and, that. And, and so she's my CR code okay. uh, when it comes to getting us to the place we need to get, right? And so if you click on the CR code, you're going to get to success because we got our executive director of Welcome. NBPSL uh, in the house. Uh, how you doing, uh, uh, Miss uh, Horsington? How you doing? Good evening. I am doing well, Mayor and Dr. <laughs> D. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. You know, this is, this, this is so difficult. This is so difficult because 
all, all you you represent uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of le legislators around the country, and each of them have their own, uh, you know, challenges. Uh, you obviously, each state are, is dealing with this issue of COVID nineteen uh, differently. Although we all are impacted adversely, but we're dealing with it differently. I guess the question is, how do you uh, help to uh, navigate uh, when you're dealing with people who are dealing with multiplicity of issues. How do you help navigate uh, the process of getting them the proper information? Because it's only when you get the proper information that you can make proper decisions. I think, you know, I, I look back to the way that I was raised. My father was a builder and he would always say, make sure you have the right tools in the toolbox before you need the tools, <laughs> right? So our job at the national office is to ensure that our legislators have the right tools in the toolbox to get the job done. Okay. And how do we do that? We bring in corporate partners, we bring in subject matter experts, we provide opportunities for them to engage, for them to learn, for them to be able to connect with the right resources in their community so that they can just go out and do the people's work. It's important that they have an idea of what's going on, which they do and because they, they're the, the rubber that meets the road. So our job is to make sure that we bring in those corporate partners that can provide them with the information, the programs, the opportunities that they then can take back to their constituencies to make sure that the needs are met for their communities. You are absolutely correct. You know, and <laughs> the, the other thing is too, you know, and, and I, think that's, I think that's the key. I think you've hit on the salient point, because if the only tool you got in the toolbox is a hammer, <laughs> everything you see is a nail, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and so what we have to do is make sure that people have the requisite tools so that they can make proper decisions, because, you know, when it comes to a situation like COVID-19, this is a matter of life and death. Exactly. You know, so, some, some things are not as consequential uh, in politics. I, I know people have set uh, personal and self-interest and, and political interests, et cetera. But, you know, this is a time where we need to put all of the politics aside and look at what's best for the greater good, right? Because yeah. we all are adversely impacted by uh, COVID-19. I, I thank you so much for, for really laying that out and, and really uh, making that salient point. Uh, yeah, let, and, let me bring let me on just, my just, Senate. Go, go ahead. You want to, you want to yeah, uh, just, ask just add to the welcome and, and just a, a, a brief comment when you see all the kind of fragmentation out there, making sure that we get back to that notion of the common good. We're missing that right now. Mm -hmm. So as this conversation continues, I, I want that theme to uh, be lifted up and hear what you're hearing from those legislators. What, what are you hearing? What we're hearing from the barbershops in the, in the community? And how, I don't know how often we're in these spaces like this together. This too was a tool. Let's use this as a tool. Exactly, yes, yes. Sure. Providing the opportunity for our, for, our, for our members and for, for our constituents to hear the information firsthand so that they know when, when it's time for them to make a decision, they know exactly where to go. So it's very important, Absolutely. thank you. Good. Let's bring up my Senator and I call him my <laughs> Senator because he is. <laughs> you know, For real, huh? Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. No, no, you know, he, he may not uh, be in my district, but let me tell you something. He's my friend. Uh, he is a leader. He's been a leader. Uh, and when I say a leader, I'm not just saying that because he's in a leadership position. That's the mm -hmm. difference between someone in a leadership position and someone who is a leader. He is truly a leader. He's mm -hmm. truly a man of the people. Uh, he, he, he does not, as, as with uh, uh, Representative Daniels, he does not bite his tongue. Okay. Uh, he's in the leadership uh, in uh, the uh, legislature in, in the state of Alabama. Uh, he uh, represents the uh, District 24 uh, there. And of course, uh, he's been uh, there for a while. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of those individuals that is approachable. You know, sometimes when you get to a certain position, <laughs> uh, that that uh, you know you stand offish. Okay. Uh, you know if you didn't know he was a senator when he was out <laughs> hanging out, you wouldn't know he was a senator. <laughs> so, so you say when he comes into the barbershop, I may if, not know. If, if he gave it the barber, like we in the barbershop now, if he never told you he was a senator, you would never know because he All can right. talk just like you. 
right? <laughs> and he's that comfortable with that. And ladies and gentlemen, please help me and we welcome go. a dear friend of mine, Senator Bobby Singleton snaps. from Thank the state so of much. Alabama. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, my friend, how are you doing? Hey, thank you, Omar. I'm doing great, man. It's great to see you. I apologize for being late. I was here at the uh, Capital City Club with a group of students here who are interns who uh, had me on a panel this afternoon, and I got my Eastern Time and Central Time all so mixed up <laughs> through my office. So I apologize, man. Oh, I, no. Please forgive me. No, no, yeah. you don't have to. Why are you apologizing to me, man? You know, you can't, you know, there, there are certain people who cannot do any wrong. You can't do any wrong with your brother, right? You, we, we, we all good. Yes, uh, thank you so much for, for giving us this platform, man. And I, I think it's so important. It's just in there, just trying to educate these kids, what we were talking about just then. Some of the same things you were talking about now, how do we are being able to legislate through this pandemic and how we are able to pass legislation and policy and, and making sure that people are staying safe. And, and so, you know, they're, they was in there drilling me with some real pointed questions, you know, so that's why I couldn't get away to get to Hold on, tell, tell me what's one of the yeah, questions. Listen, I mean, that's a good, bring, bring, bring them into the house. I mean, right. tell us what yeah. the questions they were asking. Real intelligent. Well, yeah. well at, at the end of the day, they was wanting to know, because Alabama is one of the states that, you know, in, in, in the midst of this pandemic, that we, we were able to thrive in our economy. And they were asking about how we, were we able to do it and, and how, you, they're looking at a lot of other states, they lost money and Alabama were able to go through it and, and continue to make money and, and be able to thrive and have uh, continuous budgets. And we were able to tell them how we, you know, just how we invest our money and, and how we're spending money with this opera fund right now and being able to build water systems in rural communities where poor folk don't have water right now, making sure that they get the opportunity to have rural hospitals be able to get money. And so we, we're, you know, we've been doing a lot here in the state of Alabama that a lot of people don't know, but quietly doing it and making sure that we are taking care of our people. You know, I asked the question to uh, Representative Daniels. I'm going to ask you, Senator uh, Singleton. Uh, you know, in, in, when you are in a highly partisan environment, and this is not just relegated to Alabama, but obviously Alabama is not exempt from this concept. How do you get the people that you sit down at the table with who are Republicans, you are Democrat, how do you get them to understand as with uh, our executive director, how do you get them to understand that, that good public policy as it relates to COVID-19 is, is a common good? This is for everybody's good. How, how do you get them to, to detach themselves from partisanship around a pandemic to understand that, that that the COVID doesn't care what your political affiliation is. Well, you know, it's been very hard here in the state of Alabama because we've had a set of leaders who really act like they don't believe in the pandemic. You know, right now we have a COVID outbreak on, on the Senate floor, you know, and 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 people are not requiring masks and, uh, and, and are making sure that we're getting adequate testing that we need. But at the end of the day, uh, when you have to look at some of the things that we're doing, you have to sit back and say to them that, you know, we're one Alabama. And so if we want this economy to flow just like they brag about, we continue to bring in money. If you want people to continue to go to work, we got to do those things that keep people safe so they can go to work. We got to be able to do those things that keep schools open. And those are the things that we have to do. Instead of passing the book down to the local people, we have to do it at the state level. And so right now, Omar, to be honest with you, we're still trying to peel back the onion here in Alabama to make sure that they understand because you got a lot of Trumpers here who will continue to fight whether or not this virus is real, whether or not we actually need testing, whether or not we need to set up vaccination clinics around the state. So we are having to fight that fight to our Republican counterparts just to believe in this virus. Well, let, 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 I want to do that. Since you said that, I want to bring up Meg. I, I hope you are, are preparing. I want you to run the number. Because, <laughs> because I, you know, what I don't think is that sometimes people forget that these are human beings. This, you know, sometimes statistics and numbers cease to motivate you. But if you can associate each one of those numbers to a human being, to a family, to a community, 
then we can begin to see how this virus has impacted the entirety of our country and the world uh, and how it continues to grow in terms of its hurt and pain exponentially. Uh, we, Meg Jordan, <laughs> running up. The Public Health Minute. Go ahead, Meg. All right, everybody. Um, so this is actually two weeks worth of numbers because we missed you last week. So in the past two weeks, so that's since January 6th, we have had 8.9 million new cases of COVID-19. Um, and to keep the number real, I know about six of them, right? So in the past two weeks, we've had 20,000 people die of COVID. And we've had, on the flip side, we've had 3.5 million Americans become fully vaccinated. We're gonna talk about fully vaccinated in, our, in next week, but I wanna bring us back to that. In the past two weeks, 9.4 million Americans have gotten COVID-19 boosters. Thanks so much, man. Uh, that's our uh, public health minute. And uh, of course, <laughs> that's our segment where we really talk about it. Uh, bring us back to uh, our, uh, have we finished everything? We got that? Okay, bring us back to the Hollywood Squares uh, so that I can uh, uh, see the people that, that we're talking about. When you look at, uh, I'm not, I'm Madam Executive Director, when you look at those kinds of numbers, is, is there a sense of urgency to do something policy-wise? You know, you, you heard what Senator Singleton said that even in the Senate, where there's an outbreak, people are still reluctant to wear masks, which is a one of the least things you can do on public health mitigation. Measures. There's definitely an urgency to to get to get things done and to have others to be able to see what it is that you're trying to get done. And and I think of this commercial. Um, that I saw recently when they were talking about just something simple as the number of people that are injured in uh, accidents with bicycles. And they asked this guy, how many do you think is okay? And he said, oh, about 50. And they asked him to turn around and there's 50 people that he knows. And when he looks to see that these are people that I know, then the, the acceptable amount is zero. So how do we get it in the minds of those who don't want to be vaccinated, who do not believe in wearing masks, get them to see that these are people that you love, your moms, your dads, your, your, your grandbabies, and get them to visualize and take ownership. But at the same time, and we, we can't sit back and just wait for them for the light bulb to go off. We still have to do our work to do our job and to continue to educate them and, and just educate our, our communities that this is the way that for us to survive, that this, we're all in this together. That's right. right. And right. we need good analogies. And that's the first time I've heard that one. I think that's excellent right. because a lot of the people who have also passed away have left children behind. Right. So we have caregivers, grandmothers, fathers, uncles and aunts who are no longer there many of them are going to end up in the foster care system. Now we're back to that, again, infrastructure. Is it ready to handle that kind of surge? Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Those are messages that we can disseminate through our network, you know, barbershops and salons. More examples from the legislators of what analogies work when you're trying to communicate these complex issues. You know, one of the things, uh, of Representative Daniels, is this, uh, there are... Um, there are residual effects and impacts uh, on communities. Uh, one of the things that Dr. T just mentioned is that the number of children that are being orphaned uh, due to COVID. Uh, uh, we do know that uh, I think uh, that's something we don't talk about. Black children have a problem getting adopted regularly. When you compound it with what we're dealing with now, it, it creates even more of a dire situation. How much, and, and I want you to unmute, how, how much does leaders like yourself in, in the legislature understand the residual effects, not just what's happening here, but what happens long-term as well? 
Well, Mayor, we're very fortunate to have advocacy groups that really help arm us with the, the latest and greatest data on these type of issues. Uh, advocacy groups that are not afraid to, to advocate for the poor and, and advocate for communities that don't have voices for themselves. And what we're beginning to find is that uh, due to COVID, there is there's a significant increase uh, in children going to the foster care system. And so, uh, and knowing that, uh, we know that the, the foster care system is not really equipped right now, uh, modern enough to really deal with the growing number of, of, of children, especially with uh, how, how this pandemic has, has really uh, decimated the uh, African-American community. Uh, the numbers does us no justice uh, because we have folks dying in our communities uh, when this pandemic first began and Representative, I mean, Senator Singleton and I were pushing to get more testing. It took several months for us to even get tests done in some of these communities. And so um, right now we, we have to figure out how do we help uh, the foster care system? How do we help even mothers? Right now, uh, child care is an issue. Uh, mothers are having to leave the workforce because of the hybrid models that exist in some schools and some schools that have been you know, going virtually and, and mothers having to be able to take care of their children. And then the lack of, the, the lack of uh, opportunities for childcare uh, presents another barrier for, for our families, which further uh, hurts them long-term. And so, yes, we see it. We see it each and every day. That's why we've been advocating for uh, more programs like Cradle to Pre-K and Pre-K in general uh, but also broadband uh, in communities like in the Black Belt where uh, Senator Singleton represent and I'm from, um, we see a lot of the young people, a lot of those communities have, are unserved. Uh, there's almost 300, 350,000 people in Alabama uh, that don't even have access to internet at all. Mm -hmm. and, and let alone the ones that are uh, being un unserved. Uh, and so uh, the, the infrastructure is just not great, um, and we're doing all that we can to ensure that the dollars that are coming through the state from the federal government, uh, now we sit on the committee, to overs the oversight okay. committee, <laughs> to determine where those dollars go. Before, when Trump was in office, uh, we were on the advisory committee, right? But now we've demanded to be on the actual oversight committee to distribute these funds. So when the CDC issues a report with, with a title like, uh, the hidden U.S. COVID-19 pandemic, orphaned children, more than 140,000 U.S. children lost a primary or secondary caregiver due to the, due to the oh. COVID-19 pandemic. Does that kind of data move the needle? Or do you also have to have the story, the, the, the mom, the, the 50 people who represent those numbers? So, What's the balance? So, so to your point, uh, Dr. T, I think you have to have the narratives, but you also have to make the data relate to the actual areas. Uh, national data is oftentimes ignored by lawmakers all over the country. But when you're making it real to the actual community, or you can put it, or you can use things like the heat map of identifying areas where there are extreme poverty and make those numbers real, and then you pull those narratives of those local narratives, I think those are the things that touch people. Right? Hyper local. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You got yeah. as you as you indicated, you have to lower the you have to lower the hate. And right. if you're not speaking directly to those communities, uh, oftentimes, you know, they're going to ignore it. And so so we got to keep that going. And it's important uh, to have programs like this really educating our mom, uh, our, the moms and dads and uncles and aunts and cousins and, and the people that are in the barbershop, <laughs> the beauty salons uh, in the places that really don't get their news uh, from television or don't get their, they get their news from online or radio programs or, you know, they're star people that relate to them, you mm -hmm. know, and the messenger is important. Absolutely. We've been allowing the messengers to deliver the message in our community, not to look like us. So okay. therefore our community is not going to have an urgency to respond or re react to something until they see people that look like them. Right. And, and also, you know, you make your friends before you need them. Absolutely. Uh, so, so they look for people who they have relationships with already in place. I want to I want to ask two questions. One is, uh, Delegate, I want you to, to help us out. You know, uh, Representative uh, Daniels made a point. He's saying that, you know, 
a lot of people, let's say in the state of Alabama, do not have access to broadband or to the internet at the same level as others. When you see situations like the, uh, the White House saying, um, go on the internet and order test kits, this, that creates an automatic uh, disadvantage for people who do not have that ability. Is that correct? That is correct. It, it creates a, a, a you know, it, it's a barrier, a barrier to access to care, right? Because they don't have access to a computer. And then you can complicate it more when you don't speak the language or when you don't know how to read and write, which many people, you know, are not able to. So as, as the government, the government has to go where the people are and you have to think outside the box. Just like when we started testing in Prince George's County, we had the testing sites out there at Six Flags where a lot of the uh, you know people in the community were not able, they don't drive, they rely on public transportation. So you have to really think and say, how can I make this work? Well, you have mobile, you know, trucks, they will go out to the buildings and you start door knocking and you go to the churches, which is what we did, Mr. T knows that. <laughs> and you go out there and you door knock and you form partnerships with the hospitals. And they came, they came to the community and they you know, administer the vaccine. So you have to make it comfortable. You go to the schools where the children are, right? You talk to the pediatricians and you say, you're already, you know, uh, uh, administering the vaccine to young kids, why don't you do the whole family, right? What a concept, <laughs> right? You make it easier for people. And I think that it's really important for us to, as Representative Daniel said, you need the right messenger because we are trusted sources. The message is well received when you trust that person, right? Yeah. When you know that person, so it's important to have different people deliver the messages and the right person. But I also want to go back to what Representative Daniel was saying. You know, how important it is, I think, as a policymaker to make sure that every bill we have does has the fiscal note does an analysis on the impact on the black and brown communities. You know, it's not just the money, the impact on the businesses is also the impact on certain communities. And I think that, you know, what we did, I did this last session was that I actually introduced a bill, House Bill 78, which is titled the Maryland Commission on Health Equity, the mm -hmm. Shirley Nanton Pulliam <laughs> Health Equity Act of 2021. There we so go. So the commission is tasked with deploying a health equity framework. So what it does is that it, requires that every department in the state of Maryland, when developing a policy, must develop a health equity framework. It also has a subcommittee on data because the data speaks for itself, mm -hmm. right? I remember being in law school and, and there was a concept that said, red is a black couture, the thing speaks for itself, right? So you have the data, you also need the stories, but the yeah. data is so important, right? And, and this bill requires that of every single department. And it requires that this um, committee, right, commission must be represented by all those secretaries or their, or their accident, their representative. They must come and meet at least four times a year. And it's important because we can't just talk about it. You have to put it in law. So I know sometimes people say you can shoot and legislate common sense. Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you have to say it. It needs to be done. You know, what's interesting, uh, you made a salient point, uh, Delegate um, Pena Melvin, um, and that is trust. And I want to go to uh, Senator uh, uh, Singleton. Uh, you know, this notion of trust, man, is not, you know, minor. It's a major issue uh, as it relates to trust in government, trust in the healthcare issue. Uh, in institutions, how, how do you overcome that in your communicating to your constituency uh, when they're saying, hey, hey, Senator, I trust you, but I don't trust the system? 
I need you to unmute. Unmute. Well, the thing is that what we try to do is to lead by example. In this pandemic, what I did was it started out is trying to get that trust into the community. I will get on a phone call every day. I represent eight counties. And every day uh, of the week, I would have a phone call with leaders of those communities and letting them understand exactly what was coming down, where the resources were, how they can get a hold to the resources, and how we can disseminate that information out to, to the people. We have to be out there on the forefront and letting people see that we are out there and willing to give this information out so that people who trust us, that we say that, hey, the system is there, let's work it out. I got a lot of my friends who say, look, man, I don't want to take that, that, uh, that, that vaccine. You know, and, and, and I brought it to them like this. I said, well, you know, you don't want to take the, the, the vaccine. I said, well, you know, Pfizer, you know, made, you know, one of the vaccine, I said, it's the same people that made the little blue pill. You trust them with, you know, the little blue pill with your, you know, with your forever trust and you don't ask what's in it, you know? And brother said, when you put it like that, I'm going on my way to get me a vaccine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Metaphors matter. You know? <laughs> Metaphors matter. And so, they, they, know, they, 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 they not question it as a little blue pill, right? <laughs> they don't question a little blue pill, but they, you know, but they want to question it. So, but what you have to do is allow people to see you as the leader willing to do the things that is right by the people themselves. So if they trust that you are the person who are doing right by their community, they usually will follow. And so I've been at this for a long time, Omar. I don't just get involved with my community when there are crises. I get out there when the sun is shining, not just okay. when it's raining. <laughs> and so when you're there all the time, you don't have a problem with trust factors with people. And when you're leading them on a, on a daily basis and, and disseminate information to them, then that's when you don't have to worry about the trust piece. That's how I deal with it in my communities. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we wanna do, and this is something that we do uh, on each of our uh, programs, uh, uh, and that is we try to get a pulse of how people feel uh, individually. And then we show how it looks collectively in what we call the word cloud. And so what I want you to do is, uh, Dr. T, uh, let them know how they can uh, engage in the word cloud. Just just kind of give them the instructions. And so just, you're all representatives of constituents. And at some point it all comes together and you, you how are you feeling today in the context of this pandemic? What word comes to mind? And just type those words into the, into the chat. And our folks out there on uh, Facebook just also use the, uh, uh, the chat function. They just put those words in and for 60 seconds, We'll let those words collect in the team behind the scenes. Uh, we'll right. build the cloud for us. Whatever you're feeling now, just whatever. Don't don't overthink it. Just whatever word First comes thing. to your mind, right? The first word that comes to your mind of how you feel right now, just put that word in, and uh, we're going to see what it looks like collectively. One of the things that we want to do, we have to realize that uh, you know people are on an emotional roller coaster. Uh, there are people who are losing uh, uh, lo loved ones, yes. uh, and they and they really and for next week we're going to be dealing with uh, psychologists and and uh, and and people who are in uh, counseling to to help people deal with uh, and address the issue of of loss mm -hmm. or or trauma associated right. with the pandemic, right? The the uncertainty of what's going to happen with them in terms of their their jobs and, and other things like that. It's, multi, it's a multiplicity of things that people are, are having to deal with, compounded by uh, the other things that they've uh, been dealing with before. As uh, the delegate talks about, you know, we talked about um, as it relates to health disparity issues, mm -hmm. comorbidities, and all of those things that we have to deal with anyway. <laughs> and, 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 and Senator, I want you to help me out. Who was talking about the number of uh, hospitals that have closed in the state of Alabama? Who, who was that? Was that you, uh, Representative Daniel, or you, Senator Singleton? I can't. I can't hear you, Sing. Uh, 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 Wait, I thought it was uh, uh, Representative Senator. Daniels. Uh, one, one of you, but I, one, one is you. Both of y'all can talk because I, I, you all talk to each yeah. other. All the time. <laughs> I, I, I want to bring and and and. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, my executive director, I want, I want everybody just unmute. I want to have a conversation. Uh, delegate, you can unmute. I just want to have a conversation. When, when you're talking about communities that's already suffering, yes, right, with with lack of health care, access to health care, yes. not having a relationship with a doctor that they already trust, yep, right, that makes it even more difficult to get people to trust now because those trust relationships, trusted relationships were not in place prior to now. It's like the, the, the Senator saying, I don't just see you when it's raining, I see you when the sun shines. <laughs> so I see you all the time. So, so you know, that's important. So, so Senator, tell, tell me what you're thinking. Well, I'm thinking, you know, in, in Alabama, we had about 16 rural hospitals to close. And in that 16 rural hospitals that's closed, you're talking about a population of over about 200,000 people that are being affected, that having to travel now uh, tens of, of miles to get to health care. And some of them having to go across the state lines and living right on the, on the state line. And so with that going on, you know, right now with these opera dollars, we're now trying to look at how do we protect that certificate of needs and, and get those people back, or even to replace it with, with, uh, with telemedicine. And we're looking at trying to be innovative and bring in telehealth, telemedicine, some of these rural health centers to make sure that they could at least have the access to a doctor so that they could have, and then, then transportation is the next issue that we have to bring on board with that. So those people who are having to travel that far to the doctor now, we got to get them to the doctor. And what we're trying to do now is install those rural uh, telemedicine pieces in here. So, so you're right, the trust is leaving them now. People. A lot of people just saying, hey, I'm giving up. I don't have a doctor. Uh, I know people who, I know people, uh, Omar, that was in my county, in my rural hospital, where we didn't mm -hmm. have respiratory therapists, that we don't have a people to even run a vent in the area because of lack of personnel who have to travel 120 miles to the doctor. And we had people to die in the ambulance on the way there simply because there was no vents to be put on on a local level to help save their lives. So this pandemic has taken a lot of families out. And when you look in these rural areas, that's where it's hurt the most. Well, think about this, uh, Representative Daniels. We're talking about, thanks, uh, Senator. What, what we're talking about is, again, being compounded by the lack of uh, uh, broadband in the rural community. Uh, the senator's talking about we need to have telemedicine. When you have telemedicine, you have to have broadband, right? Correct. That, all of that comes together. So, so how do you have that conversation without first making sure that the infrastructure is in place to do what you're proposing? Help me out with that, uh, Representative Daniel. Well, that's why. Um... We, the senator and I have been focusing a lot. Uh, we're in the leadership meeting with the governor and, and the Republican leadership. Uh, that's why we're focusing a lot on broadband. Um, I think if we, we, we got maybe, what's it, $271 million uh, that's going to be focused on broadband from the ARPA fund. But we know that in order to get broadband in every area, of the, every corner of the state that need it is between three and $5 billion to do that, right? And so this is just a drop in the bucket. However, we believe that focusing on unserved areas that have never been served first. Uh, a lot of our um, health departments around the uh, state of Alabama, they do have access to, to, to inter internet access. And so what the center is talking about uh, relative to the telemedicine is just an avenue. But the other, the other piece, uh, Omar, that I think is important for us to really understand is that there, there are 67 counties in Alabama. Mm -hmm more than 38 counties don't have an OBGYN in it. Hold up, say that again. Mm. Are, 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 Out of 67 counties, 38 of those counties, more than 38 of those counties do not have an OBGYN, which is why the maternal mortality rate is as high as it is, and the infant mortality rate as high as it is. And we're trying to force Medicaid now um, a pregnant woman, a, a woman that has a child, only have access to health care on Medicaid 90 days after giving birth. That's it. It expires 90 days after giving birth. Postpartum, there, there's no health care opportunities beyond 90 days for, for a, 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 a mother that's, ha that's had a child. And so wow. we're trying to push the basic things like 
extending that to a year, right? And trying to expand Medicaid so that it covers those individuals. But you talked about the comorbidities that exist within our communities. Well, we know what those maps are. We know what that footprint is. But because it's not touched the communities of those senators and representatives that are representing other areas, they don't care about that. So we have to continue to educate people because it may be us today. And it'll be them tomorrow. And this pandemic has exposed those vulnerabilities. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Across right. communities, across race and income classes. Right. You're absolutely right. And you, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I'm bring. we've just brought up our uh, OB, uh, YG, YN, and all of that. <laughs> OB, OB1, GYN. <laughs> yeah, all of that. We, we, got, we got our gynecologists right here. Uh, resident. On, on with us, the resident gynecologists <laughs> right here with us, uh, Dr. Right. Carol Ritter. I, you know, when you, when you hear, Dr. Ritter, when you hear uh, situations like what Representative Daniel said, what does that make you feel? It makes me feel grateful that you know because I have been at OBGYN for 35 years and I've seen this problem for a long time and I've been legislating as much as I can. And I really appreciate what you legislators do. I just wanna thank you for what you do because it is a thankless job of what you do. And from the deepest part of my heart, I love hearing that you know this is a problem. And I know that you balance your budgets on the backs of Medicaid, but I know that you know that that's wrong and that that has to be fixed. Um, we're at the mercy of your policies and it, the trickle down effect has affected us now that we've tied ourselves up in knots to the point where uh, we're choking. And uh, the policies and good leadership have to get us out of this. We have to work together as institutions. I love that, it, that healthcare, um, public health is front and center in every legislature in America right now, as it should have been for a very long time. So thank you. You know, you know one of the things, uh, let's bring up Sandra uh, Jenkins uh, with the uh, force, because we want to, uh, bring in some people who are out there in the streets. How are you feeling today, uh, uh, Sandra? I'm feeling back to normal. <laughs> I'm taking the Hippocratic Oath for the World Warriors. <laughs> I'm ready. All to right. Go. She I'm, recovered. She tell, recovered. Tell, tell, yes, tell, tell them a little bit about, tell, we have uh, people here. So tell them a little bit about what happened to you recently. Well, just recently, I was um, tested positive. Uh, and initially, I, I didn't have any symptoms. And uh, about three or four days after I was exposed, I started feeling bad. And I just contacted my primary care doctor and he had a uh, my chart uh, appointment uh, via online. And uh, he said, well, we have to go along with the fact that you are uh, tested, you know, you may be positive for COVID. So you need to start quarantining now. However, the following day, I started feeling really, really bad. I called him back and he said, Sandra, I think you need to consider maybe want to go to the emergency ward. You may not want to go because, you know, it's really crowded, but let them know that you're having these problems and hopefully they'll take you because of the fact of your autoimmunity issue. So um, I went and when I got there, my God, goodness, Dr. Ritter, I must say, I, I really feel for you. I mean, that emergency ward was unbelievable. Um, the hour, the, the, the time uh, just sitting in there, people have been there for the day before. So as I sat there, I started feeling worse and I said, I'll just sit here. And um, 15 hours had gone by and that following morning at 630 in the morning, that's when the doctor uh, called me back and tested me and told me that I was tested positive. However, because I was boosted, um, he said, you, you, she said, you, you've had, you've done everything you did, could do. You did everything you could do. So Sandra, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. You know, you just have to really just get through this, go home, quarantine, stay hydrated, you know, and, uh, you know, take, you know, over counter meds and this little uh, oxygen monitor with you, uh, any event that your oxygen levels decline. However, you know, it took quite a while for the symptoms to actually subside. I mean, I, I was just baffled. I mean, right now I still have a little bit of, you know, tightness uh, slightly in the chest area. However, you know, with a little, uh, the albuterol that I was prescribed, um, it's working, it's working. 
So as I tell everybody, you know, it was the booster that saved my life here. Okay. And that's what I will advocate in the salon. Right. Okay. Uh, we, we, right. We, we, we want to talk about uh, mandates. And, mm-hmm. and I, want, I, want, I want you all to kind of help me out with this. Let, let me do this before <laughs> we do that. Let, let, me, let me show you what we feel collectively. I'll yeah, bring up a word cloud. Let, let's, let me do that. And then we'll talk about mandates. So the, the larger the word, the more people who said that word, and uh, you can keep adding even while we're talking here. Yeah. Challenged. Uh, look look it, at this, it, Omar. Yeah. Challenged, hopeful. It's still hopeful. It's, yes. it's still, still there. Concerned, confused, sharing, uncertain, productive, stretched thin, tired, healthy. <laughs> right. So, so you know, there, there, there are a lot of feelings that we have. And because, you know, I think we're going to move into, Dr. T, you talked about moving from a pandemic for it being endemic. Yes. Uh, and I think we may have to conclude or resign to the fact that this uh, virus may be endemic. That How like the we? flu and the, you know, and the other uh, issues that we deal with annually, we, it's, it's mm-hmm. just a part of, we have to learn to live with it is what I'm saying. Uh, indeed. And again, finding the right analogies because COVID is not like the flu when it comes to some of the long hauler symptoms. So no one should play with this and just run out and go get it. Um, And I think that's the other part of the story we want to tell, uh, particularly what you're hearing in the barbershops and salons, the people who have made it through, you've helped many of them because you've been vaccination sites. The people who are suffering long hauler they're going to start talking to you. We need to tell their stories as well and keep the infrastructure that we put in place uh, viable. And so for my legislators, uh, we, we've done some of what you've described. We had data being presented. Now we have an authentic voice right from the community with Sandra and your personal story can inspire others, Sandra. And Uh, For my friends who are watching the news and seeing public health professionals being attacked in public, Mm, uh, having people fight over masks, uh, that's the other area in the context of mandates, Omar. Mm. How do do we, as we said, say, not turn on each other, but turn to each other? How do we do that in this environment we're in right now? Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for uh, for bringing that up. Let let me say this. The the, the hard truth is that when you are in leadership, you have to make hard decisions. And so, uh, Madam Executive Director, how how do you talk to your legislators about making decisions about mandates? Let me me tell you something that, the, the reason why I wanted to come to you with this. I felt so comfortable being in your conference. One is I had to send, submit my shot record, right? Before I could even come. And I was the speaker. So it, so everybody there had to do that. And while there, uh, people wore their masks, uh, even those that we knew were vaccinated because you had to be vaccinated as a requirement for attending the conference, All right. right? So, so you all have demonstrated where the greater good was so important that even those who may have some reservations about or some political uh, quirks about not doing something, that if you come to this place, <laughs> this is what you're going to do, right? Talk a little bit. How did you all come to that? You know, it, it was um, a lot of discussion about whether we would... Um, mandate vaccination. And I talked with our, with our board and said, how can we not? How can we not make this a vaccinated only conference? Because we did not want thinking after the fact, we did not want something to happen to where the focus was more on that we had a super spreader mm. being an African-American organization hosting legislators from across the country and the focus was on our communities are hit the hardest mm-hmm. and here we are bringing elected officials together 
in an unsafe environment. I, I want to salute we, you. We, we, we had to do it. We had to do it to say, if you are going to attend this conference, and it's by choice that you can attend, you will show that you are fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. you, you had to send it in. It wasn't like you said you didn't <laughs> no. have to say. That's right. You, you know, know you, you, we, you, yeah, you, you right. go by the honor system. That's <laughs> right. You go by the honor oh, system. Seriously. Yeah, you, could, you couldn't come up there and say, oh, I left my car at home. Well, then you know you need to go back down in the lobby <laughs> and find your card and register and show that you're vaccinated before you come upstairs mm -hmm. and be a part of this event. Because the messaging and the 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 things that we wanted to share, the education opportunities that we wanted to prepare our legislators for so that they can go back and do the people's work was too important to worry about someone who did not want to be vaccinated. We wanted to have a safe environment to where our members could interact with each other, get the information that they needed and return back to their safe houses. So we, we bit the bullet and said that we believe that our legislators would understand and not have a problem. We made the process as simple as possible to upload your, your vaccine so that everyone felt comfortable with that. And they knew you cared about them because uh, Omar, I know the story because Omar was sending me uh, photos of the kit and the whole process. I was so impressed. And we were sharing that on our social media platforms. I think we have to lift those stories up so that more people see you can you can still come together safely. And if you call people together, you have a responsibility to ensure that they're safe. Right. You know, exactly. I, I have to say, I admire that. Um, seriously, kudos to you, because as you look at these stories, even the Supreme Court, right? Yes. Justice Sotomayor um, having to do, uh, you know, the hearings uh, on, you know, from her office on the phone, right? There was one justice uh, that, you know, has not, is not wearing a mask. And when you look and at refuse. our athletes, our athletes that, you know, refuse to get vaccinated, they get paid so much money. They're role models in our community. We have to hold them responsible. I mean, we must, it's more people need to be like you. You have to have standards and be consistent. It's yes. important. You know, you know, one of the things, and, and uh, you know, Senator, you were talking about it before, that, that even in the Senate, you all have an outbreak and you still have senators that are reluctant and hesitant to wear masks. Is that correct? That is correct. I had a senator that was on vent who in the early days was able to get off of it, almost died. And he came and, and, and was able to introduce an anti-vax bill. Wow. That he personally, <laughs> now, now the other thing too, you know, that's interesting is that this is what I don't understand. And I want you all to help me out with this. And this, I'm talking to my legislators and the, and the executive directors. Now. How is it that, you know, people who are elected officials who are fully vaccinated themselves, how is it that they can then come up with uh, legislation that does not make it compulsory for other people to either get vaccinated or to use public health mitigation like mass wear. And do I you call them out on it? I mean, you know, I mean, uh, go go ahead. You know, I think it has to do with, and I hate to say this, but it's uh, this is how I feel. It's about your value system, right, and your party value system. Those bills. When you see those bills, usually, in my opinion, they come from the other side of the aisle, right? I mean, we work with, with them, but those bills come from the other side of the aisle. You're talking um, about Republicans, a uh, delegate? The, I mean, the Republicans, that's correct. <laughs> I mean, that's we, correct. We, we yes. where the cows can get it, you know, we don't. We don't. <laughs> yeah, so it's from the Republicans, from the Republicans, you know? And I think that, <laughs> for example, on our floor, for us to be on the floor and vote, there is a mask requirement, right? In all state buildings. But this, look, listen to this. Our governor decided to issue uh, a mandate where he requires masks in all state buildings, right? Now he's a Republican governor. We are a majority democratic legislature. Well, then what happens to the rest of the people that do not work for the state government? If you make decisions on 
on science, right? Based on science and data, it should be consistent across the board for everyone, period. But, you know, the Republican Party has decided, you know, there used to be a time where we disagree, but we went back to the facts and the data and the science. Now we, they disregard the science. They disregard the data, right? Only when it's convenient um, yeah. and there's no consistency. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really very sad, the state that we're in, in this country. And, really and, while, and while you can see it in, in, in that partisan divide, we see it even among families who are falling out over this very issue and using the word liberty, using the word, it's my liberty. And now we're talking public health, the common good. In the environments that you're in with these kinds of constituencies, how do you balance that? Well, one uh, let, let Representative Daniels talk about that because that's you. You went right where I was going because people are talking about government always try to impose themselves on you. That that even you know counties they have governments too, and so when it, when you talk about senators and legislators and delegates, they say, "Hold up, we got our own little thing. We can determine what we're going to do locally." and you should not be imposing from your level, let us decide that at the local level, that all government is local. Okay. Well, I think for me, uh, what, they, what we did in Alabama, which, which uh, the Senator uh, mentioned, uh, uh, we unfortunately responded to a mandate with a mandate and a tax, mm. meaning that in response to the mandate, uh, the anti-vaccine bill uh, was a, another mandate uh, that added a tax to protect unvaccinated employees. What? Paying people to be unvaccinated? M meaning that the state of Alabama, if a federal a contractor, where I am in this part of the uh, state, we most of our companies are defense contractors. So when the mandate came down that uh, you can terminate an employee that is not following the rules that that's not vaccinated, well, the state of Alabama uh, passed a vaccine bill to say that if that company terminates that employee, they have to pay the full benefits of that employee for up to 37 days through an appeal process with the Department of Labor. So they wow. responded to a mandate with a mandate and a tax. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna bring up uh, uh, the president of this esteemed organization called the NBC. SL, uh, none other than Representative Billy Mitchell. Uh, again, uh, when you talk about a leader uh, that leads through example, more is caught than is taught. People learn by precept and example. He is a leader uh, that leads by example. He is a courageous leader. He heads up uh, uh, the, uh, the organization where um, most all African-American state legislators in the entire country uh, reside. Uh, and so when you find someone who becomes the leader of the leaders, okay. uh, he has to be a bad brother. L ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Representative Billy Mitchell, president of the NBCSL. Some snaps. Welcome. Hey. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm, I'm mute. I am fantastic. And uh, I, I want to make this request early on in my remarks that uh, I get a copy of this. Uh, I am going to play that introduction wherever I go <laughs> uh, so that folks will think um, that I am somebody that the reality is I, I am where I am thanks to the likes of Representative Bobby Singleton, Representative Pena Melnick. Uh, who else did I have? Don't want to <laughs> miss anyone else. Uh, you got here, Representative Daniels, Anthony Daniels. Daniels. You, got your, yes. you got your executive director in the house. <laughs> and, and, and they make it all happen uh, for sure. Uh, you know, these, these are very interesting times uh, that we live in and uh, by extension, uh, very interesting times that we serve in. Uh, I, I will tell you uh, that serving in this, these pandemic times that we are, 
much of the, the, the maladies and the illnesses and the roadblocks that we have are as a result of politics, plain and simple. I think had we had a different administration uh, in when this pandemic first started, it would okay. have been treated differently. And as a result of it being respected and treated differently, uh, we would be in a different place right now. Uh, you know, in our chamber here, we started January 9th. We've had 53 legislators since January 9th contract the virus. Uh, mm. Over in the Senate side, it's an option as to whether you wear masks, whether you get tested twice weekly. Uh, in the House side, we make it mandatory, but I mean, we're in the same Capitol, same hallways. I mean, it, it, it is uh, just a dreadful situation that, that we're in, uh, simply because it, if they wear masks, it, it's, it's like they are seeding the political point that this is something that we should respect. But you know what, I, I will tell you this, uh, our ancestors have been through some tough times before. Yes. Uh, and we're going to have to learn to serve even in these 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 perilous times that we're in. Uh, I think that the people that we represent deserve no less. Uh, I just happened to be talking to the, the White House just uh, yesterday, and I'm so glad that our executive director is on here because uh, she's following and making sure that it, it, it works. And I've said to them, you know, we as legislators and some of the the folks here, remember our organization knows that we get to the White House quite often to make certain that the, the advocacy that, that is going on matches our policy positions. And we haven't been to the White House in, in because they claim uh, because of the pandemic. And we're, we're getting them out of that notion uh, because we've got some work to be done in this, this, this nation to make sure that we serve the, the, the communities that uh, uh, we represent. So despite this pandemic, we need to lead. Uh, despite what's going on, I, I encourage you to take care of yourself. Uh, you know, I, I tell my folk here, I can't afford to get sick. You know, <laughs> I, I, I don't have the kind of resources that uh, Representative Bobby Singleton has. You know, I, I just can't afford. <laughs> so I'm going to take every yes. uh, precaution that I can uh, to make sure that I'm healthy enough to to do what we have, and, and Paula has me working. So, you know, if I knew it was going to be this much work with NBCSL, I, I might have been just a regular <laughs> representative, pay my dues, and, and that's it. Uh, so, we 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 have to to leave it all behind. I'm so sorry I, I didn't join you in, in again. Just that short. No, 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 no. That you know, whenever you come, you know, you you know, you know how to drop the mic anyway. So you know, <laughs> come in, come in and drop the mic. You know, you know, Dr. King left us with an admonishment right before he died, and you are there uh, in in Georgia, uh, where he resided. Um, and, and he said, "Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? What what's your prognostication?" Uh, as it relates to this uh, pandemic. And, and you know, I have, a, I have a good friend of mine um, in legislators. As a matter of fact, he's among the longest serving legislators in this nation, black or white. Uh, he happens to be the, um, Demo uh, the nominee to be the ambassador to, to the Dominic Republic. We honored him at the, our annual conference. And, and he has a saying that uh, I, I would offer right now, the only people that create public policy in this country with our form of government as elected officials. Now we've got others who interpret public policy, we've got others who influence public policy, advocate public, but the only people that create public policy are elected officials. Uh, which means, and by our U.S. Constitution, supposedly the most important layer of government is supposed to be state government. So those state elected officials here, uh, we have a unique responsibility uh, to make certain that we ad adhere to that admonishment and do all that we can to get good public policy that will serve others. I, I, I tell the, the, the White House this all the time. You've you got folks up there that want to advocate, but you need to get the legislators in the room. One of the reasons why this Build Back Better or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and other issues are not progressing through the Congress is because they claim they don't want to upset the balance that it's up to the states to create 
good public policy. It's up to the states to run elections. Well, if that's going to be their mantra, then we need to get on it and make certain uh, that we uh, get the job done. Georgia is, is ground zero uh, for voter suppression and tactics as a result of what happened during the last election cycle. Um, by the slimmest of margins, I mean, the slimmest of margins, we elected two uh, US senators, the reminiscent of uh, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. We elected a, 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 a Black US senator and a Jewish senator. Uh, not, not happened uh, since Reconstruction. And it upset the balance of the, the US Senate. And it certainly uh, changed policy, not only in Georgia, not only in our country, but in this world. So they're coming with a vengeance to try to, to, to deal with that. And we here in Georgia recognize that. And uh, we are going to do all that we can to make certain uh, that our folks return to the polls so that they can choose who elects them, uh, choose who represents them, as opposed to those who, uh, those in office choose who gets to vote for them. Uh, Delegate, I want you to uh, take out your uh, magic wand. And I want you to uh, share with me what you think we need to do from here. What, 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 what measures can we take from a legislative perspective, not only with individual states, but collectively as, as a collective government uh, think, to address these issues? Look, I think that every state, every legislature should pass a bill that requires a health equity framework for all the state departments when they are thinking about their policies, thinking about their budget, they should really think about that and develop a framework. I think that every state should declare public health as a, uh, excuse me, racism as a public health crisis. I think it's really important. Um, I think that every state should have a bill that requires implicit bias training for all healthcare providers at the very least. I think that every state to have a law that says that when you put in a bill, that fiscal note should look at the impact on the black and brown communities. I think that every state should make sure that they have a health equity um, officer, you know, someone in human resources in the legislature as well. I think that every state needs to invest big time in public health because it's been underfunded for many decades. Um, I think that every state should think about developing a pipeline for the work shortage that we have when it comes to doctors and nurses as well. I think that every state should have, you know, um, laws that help pay for some of these loans and offer, you know, fellowship to students, especially students of color to get into the sciences as well. This is the time, this is the time to do it because we have the data, this is the time to do it because people get it. Because at the very least, I tell you what, in every household this Christmas, in many households, yes. there was someone missing at that table. That's right. Okay, someone that died because of COVID. And now it's to the point that I know so many people that have it. Yes. Because it's rampant. So sure. we need to be committed. And I am really blessed as I hear my colleagues with all due respect that I live in Maryland. Because yes. Maryland, we are <laughs> progressive. And, and that we have a strong, we have a strong black caucus and Latino caucus that works together to make sure that our policies are a priority. And we have a black speaker of the house for the first time, a That's black right. woman who made this a priority and we're no longer an afterthought. And the, the legislation you described can be shared and the advocacy around that legislation can be uh, mobilized through our network of barbershops, beauty salons, churches, the very things that we were talking about last week about the civil rights movement and the philosophy of Dr. King and what he left behind. It was building coalitions. And this technology could accelerate the building of those coalitions so that you have the advocacy to move those policies forward. Uh, we'll make those... Uh, pieces of legislation available on our website so you can see them. I want my barbers and stylists to look at those and share those with your elected officials. Uh, it wasn't easy getting those bills passed, 
but it got done. Perseverance, grit matters. You so, know, we got five five minutes left. Uh, are Dr. you kidding me? It's what? five minutes. I'm telling you, I can't think. <laughs> uh, that, what I want to do is, Senator Singleton, uh, what, what's what you'd like to leave uh, with the people? Obviously, you know, just the, the, that nugget that, that, that really will make the difference. Well, the nugget that's going to make a difference is it's going to be our involvement and how we interject ourselves into public policy and making sure that the people that we represent, that we give them all that we have. You know, I see a lot of, of, of legislators that comes and, and, and never introduce bills, but just as the sister just said, we got to make sure that we're on top of it because the people that we represent only have us. They have no other voice. And so if we're not going to be the voice for them, then they're going to be lost. So if we want our community to thrive and to be a part of the, the conversations in America, we got to be there to represent them. We just can't keep asking them to elect us and we show up for election day. But we got to make sure that we do proper things for them to make sure that they have a better sustainable life and making sure that they stay safe. All right. Amen. All, all right. All right. <laughs> my, my executive director, you, you're the executive director for all of for the whole world, for the whole United States world. King. Yes, she is. Wow, yes, she is. <laughs> she, she's incredible. Now, I, you know, before she, before she says something, I, I have now uh, given her a new name, Ciara. You know, we we we, we got the, the the we call it we call it. Uh, she is a, a calm uh, stone, right? Right? Rock. A calm rock, right? Ciara. That, like the CR code takes you to a certain place where well, she's the CR. Because if you want to go somewhere, you use uh, you use a person with her spirit and you're going to get there. She's a CR. <laughs> she's a calm rock. Solid as a rock. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, she is. I'd like to leave um, this evening's discussion with, with what I started with. As a national office, our job is to make sure that the tools are in the toolbox so that our legislators can go out and make the good policy. So that as the delegate said, every state will have those things and make sure that they're done. So if we as a national office ensure that the tools that they need to get those things done are there. The tools are ready, the tools are sharpened and the tools are on time. They are appropriate for whatever job it is that they have to do, that we are there to help them to fight their battle. So we stand behind them make sure that the toolbox is ready. All right. Thank you so very much. Uh, yes, Representative sir. Daniels. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for having, having us on and I enjoyed this discussion. And I, I agree with my colleagues about uh, the direction that we need to go in. Uh, even the, our delegate from, from Maryland uh, and, and Senator Singleton and our executive director. Um, for me, it is, um, we have to make certain that we're at the table and not on the table. Uh, we've been on the table for a long time. And so we have to make certain that we're pushing policies that are gonna have major impacts in our communities, uh, starting with our education, as I mentioned, the um, cradle to pre-K, uh, making certain that the foundation is right because we know that every dollar that's invested in pre-K saves you $7 in corrections. Uh, we have to make certain that we are uh, focusing on giving our people access to quality health care uh, and, and ensuring that they have an opportunity, mothers have an opportunity to, to be able to see a doctor, uh, and, and especially those that are uh, women that are pregnant, uh, have access to an OBGYN, uh, that we continue to fight uh, even environmental issues. Um, a lot of times you don't hear about a whole lot of environmental issues and pushback uh, in the South. Uh, but it's real as well. When you talk, when you look at Lowndes County and the issue that they're having with their sewers and, and the clean, with being able to drink, have clean water. You have places in Alabama that doesn't have access to clean water. And so we just got to keep pushing policy and pushing back on regressive policies that's negatively impacting our community so that we can, so that the next generation can stand on our shoulders. Because right now we're standing on shoulders and we're fighting and pushing to open the doors of opportunities wider for those that are coming behind us. And we have to leave the doors of opportunity wider for those that are that are that, are, that we're um, pushing uh, that what we want to come behind us. And so that's that's what I'll leave you with. Just we just got to keep fighting, but we got to communicate with each other. And right sure. now, a problem in Georgia and a problem in Maryland may be the same problems, 
but that exist and but we're not talking to each other and figuring out ways to solve those problems so we just got to communicate well the tool clock, right here thank you Omar, yeah. making this happen absolutely the, the clock on the wall says it's time to go but obviously i have to mention that andre uh, russell is here who uh has uh, uh, uh uh, an, uh, really an empire uh, in Atlanta uh, for uh, uh, barbers. Yeah. We have a barbershop in the, we, we can't, nobody can talk because because uh, we were out of time. Uh, but I want to make sure that I mention you that you are doing in tremendous things uh, in Atlanta. He has a barbershop, Mr. President, in the Atlanta airport. <laughs> and uh, when the brother can do that, we got to give him his props to Sandra <laughs> Jenkins. Come on now. <laughs> doing what she's doing, where she is. We love her so very much. Stacy Ingram Ruffin, uh, we love her doing Rejuvenate. We love her and what she's doing. Uh, Dorothy Reynolds, uh, we love you, uh, who's in Arkansas doing what she's doing. We cannot <laughs> forget our own uh, OBGYN, <laughs> gynecologist extraordinaire. Uh, Dr. Carol Ritter. Uh, and uh, so we thank each of you for joining with us on this special uh, show, the Cutting Edge Show. And of course, we uh, also cannot go any further uh, than to thank uh, our team behind the scene, uh, all of the people who make this happen that you oh, yeah. don't see on the on the uh, on the stand, on on the scene or on the screen but you do know that they are there making it happen for us. This is our illustrious tech team. And of course we appreciate them for everything they do, both seen and unseen. That's the kind and, of mentoring we do here for that next absolutely. generation. Absolutely. And again, uh, for all of you who have joined with us today, uh, I cannot say any more than thank you. Thank you is the greatest uh, two words that can be uttered because we recognize that that it's because of you that we are who we are. It's because of you that the issues that we enumerated today and the problems that we have shared today will be solved because of you. We all are possessors of some truth and as we bring our truths together, then and only then do we get closer to the truth to my president as I Get ready to leave. Thank you, sir, for your leadership. I really appreciate you and I love you with the perfect love. And as always, to all of you, Dr. <laughs> T, you know you, my man, uh, uh, who uh, really uh, convened us all here for this special time and place. We've all been called out to be called on for such a time as this. And as always, I like to leave you with these two words. Remember that I love you with the perfect love, but more importantly, remember this, you got the power. Until next week, have a wonderful day. Bye -bye. All right, you got the power. See you next time. Thank you so much.